They did like the fact, of course, of the right to one in Israel, and they'd like to change it very much, and they'd like the government to topple. Well, they're not holding a gun to your hand, but if they're saying, okay, I won't fly the plane, and uh, you, won't have a, you won't have an air force, well, it's a sort of, uh, I would say, a military coup of sorts. Hello, I'm Jonathan Tobin, editor-in-chief of the Jewish News Syndicate, JNS.org, and you are listening to Top Story, a weekly podcast where I analyze the most important stories happening in Jewish news around the world. Each week, I will break down politics, foreign policy, and culture to provide insights into what is going on behind the headlines. Hello, and welcome to Top Story. Thanks for joining us. Today, we have an important conversation for you about Israel and the United States and the Netanyahu family with Ido Netanyahu, the writer, poet, and physician who is the youngest brother of the hero of Entebbe and the prime minister. But first, I want to remind you to like this video and podcast, subscribe to JNS, and click on the bell for notifications. I also want to remind you that you don't have to wait a full week for more top story analysis. There is a daily top story podcast where I share more news and analysis with you about the most significant issues we're facing today. You can find the daily show under Top Story with Jonathan Tobin on the JNS channel on Apple, Spotify, Google Play, or wherever you get your podcasts. Also, I'd like to let you know that JNS is also on Telegram. You can find the latest news, including Top Story and other JNS TV content there by subscribing. And now to today's program. If Israel is in crisis, what should Americans be doing about it? If this were the sort of crisis that Israel faced in the first decades and involved wars of survival fought against Arab armies intent on destroying the Jewish state, there would be little question as to what that meant for the nation's American friends in terms of the obligation to help it defend itself. The same should apply to more recent conflicts in which Israel has been forced to respond to terrorist offensives on the part of Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad in Gaza and from Hezbollah in Lebanon, though sadly the willingness to rally to the Jewish state's defense in recent years has waned due to the impact of libelous coverage of Israel as well as a deluge of anti-Zionist and anti-Semitic propaganda. But the current crisis facing Israel is something that is entirely different. It is one that involves domestic strife, as the country's liberal Ashkenazi elites, who dominate the academic, media, business, and security establishments, have sought to maintain their hold on power despite their preferred political candidates and parties losing elections. They oppose the efforts of Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's government to reform an out-of-control judiciary that has seized for itself the right to overrule the elective representatives of the people on any issue and on any pretext. Yet the way this debate has played out is not merely one about constitutional principles, but rather a sort of cultural war in which secular liberal Ashkenazi elites have sought to demonize the religious, nationalist, and Mizrahi population as unfit to govern, no matter how many elections their preferred candidates win. The notion that the good Israel must prevail over the allegedly bad one in order to preserve democracy, even though the latter has won by democratic means, isn't merely hypocritical, It's a formula for the crack-up of the country's social fabric. We don't know how this argument will resolve itself, though ultimately the decision must be made at the ballot box and not in the streets. But whatever the outcome, the one thing that ought to be clear is that this is not a crisis in which the intervention of American Jews or the American government ought to be welcomed. It is true that throughout the history of the Jewish state, Israeli politicians on both the left and the right have sought the intervention of Americans. That was bad enough when it concerned security issues and those involving debates about settlements, borders, and the futile efforts to achieve peace with the Palestinians, and the desire of some American liberals to aid the efforts of the U.S. government to assist the Israeli left in gaining victories it couldn't win at the ballot box, enforcing concessions to Palestinians who aren't interested in peace. But when it involves efforts to intervene in purely domestic Israeli politics, 
it becomes even more outrageous. That is why the decision of most American Jewish organizations to join with the Biden administration to take sides in Israel's debate over judicial reform is both wrongheaded and potentially dangerous. The idea that American Jewry would regard not just Netanyahu, but his voters as the moral equivalent of what Hillary Clinton called the deplorables, who voted for former President Donald Trump, is to damn the majority of Israeli Jews who are Mizrahi religious and nationalist as somehow less worthy of respect or even the right to vote and govern than the Ashkenazi secular and liberal minority. That is a formula not just for helping to fuel civil unrest in Israel, but for a tragic schism within the broader Jewish world. That is why those Americans who are repeating the hyperbolic and completely dishonest rhetoric about Netanyahu seeking to destroy Israeli democracy need to not just rethink their stand, but to contemplate the consequences of their rhetoric, which is both exacerbating the situation inside the Jewish state and giving aid and comfort to its enemies who are happy to embrace the notion that it is not a democracy. To discuss this and much more, we're pleased to have with us today someone who has both intimate knowledge of American and Israeli Jewry, as well as an eye is an eyewitness to history as a member of one of the country's most illustrious and controversial families. Ido Netanyahu is an Israeli playwright, author, and physician, as well as being the son of the great historian Bitzion Netanyahu and the brother of Yonatan and Benjamin Netanyahu a veteran of the Israeli Defense Forces elite Sayeret Matal, as well as a graduate of the Hebrew University Medical School. He is the author of several books and plays that have been produced in New York, Tel Aviv, and elsewhere around the world. Ido Netanyahu, welcome to Top Story. Thank you very much. I'm glad to be here. Well, Dr. Netanyahu, thanks so much for taking the time to join us. I want to start by noting that you are someone who has a pretty good understanding of both Israel and America as someone who spent a large part of your youth in the United States, as well as your studies. This is a moment when American Jews, as well as the U.S. government, seem to be taking sides in Israeli politics in what is a purely domestic issue with respect to the debate about judicial reform. Do you think this is something that most Israelis welcome, or is it just par for the course that Israelis on one side or the other of any debate are always looking for American backing? Uh, no, I'd say, well, I think the left in Israel or the opposition certainly welcomes it because that enhances their stand. Uh, the fact that the U.S. government is taking a side on the eternal issue in Israel is quite amazing, actually. Now, obviously, the matter of judicial reform they don't really care about that. I mean, there's nothing, there's nothing in the judicial reform uh, that uh, they would oppose or should oppose. Uh, certainly not the recently passed law uh, that talks about uh, trying to limit something called the unre- use of the unreasonable clause. You, you yourself uh, addressed this issue uh, very well and very succinctly. Uh, I mean, this is something that does not exist in America or in that fact in any other country in the world. And the fact that we passed the law to limit it just enhances democracy instead of the other way around. I won't go into the whole issue. You, you Once again, you discuss it at length as, as well as other people. Uh, and American Jews, the liberal Jews, not, not the other Jews, not people like you, are taking the side of the opposition. That's all. I mean, they're going into this. They're plunging into this. Uh, certainly, uh, the majority of the population in Israel, uh, which supports the government, we know that because there have been recent elections, uh, and the majority that uh, wants uh, these reforms in one form or another uh, don't like this kind of intervention, either by uh, the American Jews uh, or the American government. Yeah, uh, such interventions always tend to backfire. But right now, there there seems to be there is such a deluge of criticism of the government, um, the sort of very hyperbolic rhetoric about the end of democracy. Um, and indeed, you know, most of the organized Jewish world is buying into that rhetoric. Um, how does that play in Israel? I mean, you know, as I said, you're someone, you know, many, a lot of Israelis don't understand America any better than most Americans understand Israel, but you're someone who does understand both countries. How does that play in Israel? In Israel, how does it play? Once again, it's like I told you, you know, we, we, most of the population doesn't like it. Those on my side who are for the uh, judicial reform don't like it. 
it, but it's really not a matter of judicial reform. I mean, the American stand has to do with trying to weaken the Israeli right-wing government. They're not happy with this government, as we know. They would have preferred a different sort of government, which it would be more to their liking in terms of American policy. That has been the stand of America almost uh, ever since I, uh, I, uh, I was uh, aware of politics. Uh, the, the right is bad, the, the left in Israel is good. That's how they seem to think. Uh, previously, it had to do with the Palestinian issue. Uh, even now, it still has to do with the Palestinian issue, uh, but more importantly, with the issue of Iran, as far as I can tell. Mm -hmm. Now, once again, when I'm talking here, I'm talking off, I'm talking, um, uh, relating my own ideas. Uh, don't mm -hmm. feel that they represent in any form or manner, I have to say this, the uh, ideas or thinking of the uh, Prime Minister of Israel. Uh, but in terms of my ideas, uh, this is an attempt to try to weaken the, the Israeli government, which is also the attempt in the streets in Israel. The, uh, I mean, the, a lot of the protesters certainly believe or are very anxious about the end of democracy and such nonsense, you know, the dictatorship and the, the things that are being fed by those who are pulling the strings. Those who are pulling the strings, the higher-ups certainly do not believe in anything they, they say. There's no question about that. And I think in the American administration, they know enough about uh, constitutional law to understand that nothing, absolutely nothing in the political reform uh, is something that they should be uh, anxious about. On the contrary, uh, they should be happy that Israel is trying to copy, to some extent, the American model, which is, a, uh, which is the model for the rest of the democratic world, has been for the last 200 years, of trying to have checks and balances, proper checks and balances between the, the, judi the judiciary and the, the three uh, branches of government and the uh, legislature branch and the uh, administrative branch, the executive branch. Uh, America should be happy about this, not the other way around. But once again, this, yeah. is, uh, this is politically motivated. It has nothing, absolutely nothing to do with the actual uh, judicial reform that we're trying to achieve here in this country. Yeah. Now, you spent a good part of your youth here, you know, in the United States, albeit in an era when the assumption was that American Jewish support for Israel was more of a given than it is today. Uh, now, there are a lot of theories that seek to provide explanations for what is assumed to be a decline in support for Israel, especially among young Jews. Do you have any thought about this problem and uh, how you would compare it to issues, say, within Israeli society with regards to belief in Zionism and patriotism? I would say this, uh, the American uh, Jewish community, uh, with time, uh, the, uh, I would say the core identification with Judaism and with being a member of the Jewish people has been waning. Uh, this is not news to anybody who's uh, listening to this podcast. Uh, American Jewry is in a dire, is really in dire straits, both in terms of the uh, a just simple ignorance of what it is being Jewish, and uh, you're, you know, you're, you're not. I'm not surprised at the rate of assimilation. I think the last statistic that I saw was something like 70 percent of uh, non-Orthodox Jews are uh, assimilating and mar or marrying rather uh, non-Jewish. Uh, uh, I think it's higher than that now, but <laughs> okay, 77 point taken. Maybe 77 percent. I wouldn't know. Yeah. Uh, this is not surprising. I mean, uh, what's to keep you Jewish if all you learn about Judaism is that you eat latkes in uh, Hanukkah? and uh, that you eat hamitash and Purim, and that's what they know about Judaism, and that's Judaism for you, why maintain it? Now, it's not yeah. a matter of just uh, the being religious. I myself am not religious uh, at all. Uh, it's a matter of the Jewish identity and Jewish history and Jewish knowledge. Are you a member of a distinct group called the Jewish people or not? It's a question of really Jewish nationalism, and it's uh, been very hard for American Jews to maintain this. And certainly if you're ignorant about the value of being Jewish, it's even harder to maintain. And this is what's happening with American Jews, and it's no surprise that the support for Israel as the, uh, as the Jewish state, that is, uh, in order to identify with Israel, you have to have some sort of identification with the Jews as a people, okay? Uh, certainly the religious Jews uh, tend to think that way because the religion is a very, I would say, national religion, if you, if you can say that. Uh, sorry. Uh, but the non-religious Jews in the diaspora and certainly in America uh, don't look at it, many of them don't look at it that way. And if you don't have a national sentiment uh, as a Jew, if you're not proud of your Jewish heritage, and your Jewish heritage, once again, is not just eating uh, latkes in the Hanukkah, 
then uh, by nature, uh, you uh, you support, well, why should you support Israel? Why should you support the Jewish state? And if you don't have any of this in the contrary, you might want to criticize the Jewish state to show that you are not uh, somebody who has a different national uh, awareness other than being an American or maybe being somebody, not even American, but being somebody uh, of the universe or et cetera, et cetera, but not uh, supporter of Israeli nationalism. That, no. So I'm not surprised at all. And this is the situation in America. And, it, uh, and I'm afraid, I hate to say this, but I think American Jewry, if you ask me, maybe you don't want to hear this, not you yourself, it's, nobody wants to hear it. Uh, but I think it's doomed. That, that is how I look at it. Unfortunately, I cannot reach any other conclusion. Uh, there will be a remnant of the Orthodox, no question about that. That will remain within 30, 40 years. I have no, uh, I can't predict how, uh, how long that will be unless things change drastically, uh, unless uh, awful things might happen. I don't think American Jewry has any future. Let's turn back the page a bit now and ask you about your own experiences. As I said, you spent much of your childhood here in the United States. But as with the case with your older brothers, um, you know, your hearts, as well as that of your parents, was always in Israel, right? Oh, yeah. No, there, when we came here, there was no question we would return. We didn't think, my parents didn't think that they would stay as long as they did in America. My father wanted to pursue his research into Jewish history, specifically uh, the origins of the Spanish Inquisition, what brought it about. It had to do with the uh, understanding of anti-Semitism. Uh, we won't get into that. It's too complicated to explain in this podcast. But uh, he thought... Uh, he, hey, hey, your father was... I just know your, your father, father was author of a seminal work about the Spanish Inquisition and yes. about the Jews of Spain. That's true. So for anybody, anybody who wants to read <laughs> Ben Zion, see if you, uh, if you know, yeah, a if great you, book, they should. Uh, well, it'll take them uh, half a lifetime, but yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, they <laughs> Not quite, but it's, yeah, uh, it's, well, it's a big book. 40, 40, it's on the shelf. It's on one of the shelves behind me, but 40, it is a big book. No, I yes. think it's a remarkable book. It's unbelievable. But uh, uh, he had been the editor of the Hebrew Encyclopedia. That's like the Hebrew Britannica. Uh, he uh -huh. was the, 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 the editor-in-chief of this uh, work, but he it, it occupied all of his time. Uh, and he needed time in order to do his research. He did not have an academic position in Israel that would allow him to do this. So he went to America and he figured he'd go for two, three years, that's all. Except that one thing, you discover one thing, you know, it is maybe, I don't know, when you do research, you discover more and more things and just one year passed after another year and then another year. We all returned to Israel, the children. I actually returned when I was 15 years old. I I didn't. Tr the truth is, is that even as a child, I did not feel myself an American. Uh, I came to America at the age of ten, or ten and a half, and by age fifteen, I said, "Enough is enough. I can't take this anymore." And uh, I went back to Israel. My parents uh, agreed to it. They were not happy about it, but they agreed to it because my brother uh, Benjamin Bibi uh, also came to Israel back uh, to enlist in the army. And my parents figured, okay, he'll, he'll, you know, he'll be in charge of me. Well, little did they know that he would have no time. We met occasionally when he came home, but it wasn't, uh, it wasn't as if. But so I, I stayed with the families uh, here in high school in Israel. And uh, finally, in 12th grade, actually, I returned to be with my parents for one year. Uh, but I did not feel myself as an American. Uh, and uh, the feeling at home was always that we are Israelis. We're uh, believers in Zionism. There's no question about that. And our future is in Israel. It's not in America. The future of any Jew should be in Israel. Uh, and so that's how we felt, and that is the reason why all of us uh, returned to Israel, and certainly my parents at a certain stage in their life. Uh, once uh, my father felt that he uh, could continue the research uh, in Israel outside America, he returned to Israel. He still came months at a time to America to complete his research as well as to other countries. It's a massive it's a research. It's a, really a book that uh, gives tremendous insight into the history of the Jewish people. Yes. Uh, well, in reading your brother Benjamin's memoirs, there is no mistaking the way he was influenced <clears throat> by the example of your oldest brother, Yoni, who was the first to join the IDF and then rise in its, uh, the ranks of one of its elite units, the Sayyarat Maktal. Was there any doubt in your mind that you two would follow in their footsteps and sort of follow the same path? 
Well, no, Yoni became a professional soldier. I mean, he uh, mm-hmm. extended his services. He uh, rose to the rack of the... Uh, mm-hmm. uh, um, 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 how would you say it in English? Uh, Lieutenant Colonel. Uh, mm-hmm. Bibi himself decided to be an officer in the same unit and serve for another extra two years. Uh, I also went to this. We all served at the same time. Okay, for when I was when I was serving in the unit, Yoni was my uh, company commander for one year, and then he was the deputy commander of the unit for another year. Bibi was the Bibi was then the the uh, commander of the team uh, in the unit. I myself was also offered to go to uh, to become an officer in the unit by the then the commander of the unit, Ehud Barak, whom you all know, and uh, but I. I had no inkling for it. This is, I didn't, first of all, I was an okay soldier, I guess, I, but I didn't, I wasn't really, I didn't think of myself as a great soldier. And uh, I felt that uh, I uh, did not really feel that it was worthwhile for me and even for the unit, for the army, for me to serve an extra two years. And so I did my three-year military service and that was it. Mm. Uh, and then, well, I mean, there was unlike a... Unlike that, you chose, as you say, not to become an officer and instead decided to pursue ultimately a career in medicine rather than the army. Yeah, that's true. Um, but, but, you, you know, know. Uh, that was interrupted by the Yom Kippur War, um, so that you returned for that, but then you returned to the United States for your studies, right? No, actually, I uh, when I uh, finished the army service, I went to America to study in Cornell, uh, where my father was teaching. It was free, so that's why I chose that university. But I studied only for one month, and then the war broke out. And so I returned to Israel, and then uh, for half a year I was in the reserve duty. Uh, and then afterwards uh, I was released. I got married and stayed in Israel and went to medical school. Uh, yeah. So that, that, that's the course of events in my life. Yes. Now, um, uh, for anybody who knows that period of Israeli history, Jewish history, um, you know, one of the big events, um, but... You know, a personal tragedy for your family was the death of your brother at Entebbe. And that certainly seemed to be the seminal moment in your brother Benjamin's life. How did it shape your life in some ways as well? Hard to say. It certainly affected me to a great degree. It affected my parents. It affects, you know, that's how we, the way it is when the, the, someone who's uh, beloved uh, dies. Uh, you contemplate about life, what to do. I stopped uh, medical studies for a year, and uh, I started writing. That was the year when I started writing. I felt that uh, medicine would not satisfy me. It was not stimulating enough intellectually, and uh, I, I, I felt that way also before Yoni's death. But that year that I took a break from medical school, uh, I was thinking th- things more uh, in depth, and so I started writing. And that's how I became a writer and eventually a playwright, as well as being a physician. You can't live off of writing plays in Israel, especially when your plays are not shown here. Okay, so I, so I, uh, I continued working as a physician, but always part time, never, never full time, because I devoted really half my time uh, to to writing. Uh, Yoni's death, of course, I also devoted time to uh, writing about. Uh, Yoni's, uh, first of all, to uh, publish the book of letters, of Yoni's letters, uh, to edit them, to compile them, more than edit them. And this became a huge, very influential book in Israel. Uh, 45 years or more after it, it's first, it was first published, it's still being sold, still being read. Uh, and the, the, I remember when it was first published, the first edition read out within a day. Uh, it was a very, it's a book that really, is the the book that is responsible. That's what made Yoni become this hero in Israel, more than Entebbe. It's this book of remarkable letters uh, that really, uh, I think, have inspired people tremendously. And they're just interesting. It's an interesting read. Uh, but after that, and that, I thought that that was it. I was done with, you know, the creating a shrine of sorts <laughs> to Yoni, except that uh, some years after Entebbe, Things were getting, uh, uh, were being said and uh, written about the raid and about Yoni that did not fit with the facts as I knew them. And I knew the facts of the raid, of the preparations and the operation. I mean, I had been a member of the unit. I, I could talk to the members of the unit freely. They would discuss things with me. 
And so I felt that I felt duty bound to go to the uh, participants in the raid and uh, put the record on tape. So at least things will be known about the raid. Because the, uh, and the, the first time they spoke was to me. Uh, unfortunately, the military did not conduct a true debriefing of the operation. And so I did that, and I went from one to another, and finally came out with a book called uh, Yoni's Last Battle, 15 years after the, the raid. And that is a book that describes the operation in the part of the my brother's unit, the one that he commanded. And, uh, well, as usual, I was attacked, right? Not, not by the people of the unit, but by other people. Okay. Uh, and as I, at 30 years, I felt I had to publish another book, and that's a compilation of the testimonies about the raid. Uh, it's a tome of, uh, I think, 700 pages. It didn't end there. It finally ended, more or less, 40 years after the raid, when the members of the unit themselves, the participants, came out with their own book, and each one wrote his memoir. Why they waited 40 years, I don't know. Don't ask me. But that uh, that book that's also published was translated into English, and uh, I think it's in digital format, it certainly corroborates uh, what I was uh, relating in my own books. So I, I uh, uh, Yoni's legacy, I had to deal with it, and actually it cost me years of my life in order to get the facts straight of what was his role in the preparations to the raid and his role in the raid itself. How this whole thing Why was done. Do you, mm-hmm. yeah. Why do you think, you know, this? it's such an iconic event, sort of part of world history, not just Israeli history or Jewish history. Why, you know, and, and seemingly quite straightforward, in many ways, why was it such a source of controversy with back and forth? And, you know, why was there a need for this long, you know, decades long debate about something which on its face seems, you know, pretty, as I said, pretty straightforward? It is straightforward. The minute you start interviewing the people and finding out, you know, they remember, they relate what they remember, you know, what they, what happened. And you, you put things together and you, you arrive at the facts. It's not, it's not difficult. It's not like my father's historical work. They just to look at documents from 500, 600, 700 years back and try to put things together. I mean, being a historian is probably the most difficult uh, uh, profession in the world, I think. Being a true historian, one that really examines the facts. But here, it was not a, there was no question what happened. There was not a problem. But uh, when people want to distort what happens and when other people don't come out and say, hey, you guys are lying. Okay, this is dishonest. This is what happened then uh, the burden is on you. And of course, uh, who's going, who's, if somebody is not telling the truth and uh, with both to the army and to other sources and to people who write books and, uh, and the only person to contradict him is the brother of Yoni, uh, these things uh, continue. And the press, of course, and by the time that I wrote my book, uh, Bibi was already involved in politics. The press was all against of the Netanyahu family, because they're on the right wing, uh, the right side of Israeli politics. The press is on the left side, as is usual in Western countries. And uh, so they took that part. So you have to battle. Uh, I mean, the amount of uh, attacks against me, uh, just uh, unbelievable. Regarding this, it's, it's, it is quite amazing. And you would expect uh, those uh, brave people, and they are brave. I mean, from the unit, they, they were very brave in what they did in the operation. But you expect them also to be brave morally and to stand up to what is the truth. And you don't want to, uh, you don't expect them to wait 40 years until finally doing something, which is what they did. Uh, this is, has yes. to do with internal Israeli, uh, there are many things here, the group thinking, their uh, group uh, uh, climate, the way the, this special unit was built. And uh, above all else, probably politics. I don't think it would have happened to uh, the brother of someone who was a prime minister on the left side of the Israeli spectrum. It would not have happened to him. <laughs> well, uh, that, that leads to my next question, which is, as a member of one of Israel's best known, and whether fairly or not, most controversial families, how do you view the outsized attention that the Netanyahu's received? You know, especially the cover coverage of your brother's wife and children. This isn't the way Israeli politics and media used to work. I mean, no. past decades, nobody knew anything about the families. Of yeah, prime family is one thing. I don't want to go into that. But no, the right has always been besmirched by the left uh, in Israel. 
the the leader of the uh, right wing Zionist movement, Zev Jabotinsky, uh, a great uh, intellectual uh, and uh, writer himself, uh, was uh, derided as a fascist, as a Hitlerite, no less, no no more, no less. He was uh, called by Ben Gurion. His name was Vladimir Jabotinsky. Ben Gurion used to call him Vladimir Hitler. Okay, uh, same as what you hear today. Okay. Uh, Begin was uh, considered a fascist. You know, I remember when he wanted when he came to America right after the War of Independence. Einstein was among those who protested against him. How did you let in such a terrorist into America? This is horrible uh, that uh, you allow something like this to be done. Uh, when I grew up as a child, Begin was always this evil man, evil, evil man. Okay, a fascist. Once again, a fascist. And then you had our Elshur on. They're all, by the way, of course, everything changed once they once they did the left's bidding. So Begin became this. Tremendously, this wonderful human being. Once, of course, he made the agreement with Egypt. All of a sudden, he was embraced by the Israeli left and by the Israeli press. Shalom, Shalom was that, that he was he was probably more reviled than anybody else in, in Israel for several years because he was considered the father or the main instigator of the settlement movement. And so uh, there was not a day in the press that uh, went by without uh, being attacked ferociously. Uh, I remember even a character of him, uh, you could see the look of a vampire, <coughs> a vampire teeth. Uh, so this, uh, this has been the uh, fate of uh, the right wing in Israel uh, because the press is controlled by the left in Israel, always has been. Uh, the written press, certain periods of time, no, but certainly the electronic uh, media, always complete control until very, very recently, complete control by the left whether it's television, whether it's radio, it still is to a great degree, 95%. But there is this 5%, and that's very important that it's not. And then uh, and then the universities, of course, are totally controlled by the left. Uh, and uh, I mean, the basic, the, the platforms uh, of uh, expression in Israel, uh, whether it's art, whether it's uh, theater, whether it's uh, the movies, uh, you name it, is controlled by the left, and they don't want anybody to uh, uh, come in who is not of their political ilk. And so this is the situation in Israel, and that allows, when you have a press that is so politically motivated, this, of course, uh, they attack in whatever which way, and they certainly attack BB, and uh, they attack, uh, so they, why, why not attack the family? Uh, you know, hey, let's do it. So this is, this is, uh, this is the situation in Israel. It has to do with, uh, let's say, the... Uh, uh, the fact that the press here in Israel, the media, they are bankrupt, bankrupt uh, both morally and intellectually. And uh, this is the situation in Israel, and they, they, they do anything. I mean, the mere fact that they tout now these, uh, this uh, beginning of uh, dictatorship and the end of democracy, uh, these slogans that they repeat every minute of every hour of every day, uh, all the time, you know, riling people up, and uh, fausting, fausting on them these uh, slogans all the time. Uh, this is what they do. I, I don't consider it even a press. I don't know what it is. I don't know how to call it. But it's not uh, nothing objective, nothing factual. Just uh, uh, politicking. That, that's all it is. That's uh, that's why. That's how I view them. Well, I, I, I think that's you know that thing is very true. I mean, it's it's difficult from the outside looking in to see how sort of your family uh, living under such a microscope in which books and newspaper are written and newspaper columnists are continually sort of uh, playing psychologist, trying to understand your brother and imputing the worst possible motives to everything he does. But it it does, um, you know, really you know, sort of uh, impact, you know, the, the, the way democratic debate, um, you know, uh, takes place in Israel. Um, especially when they use words like coup as, as not as opinion, but as, as if it were a fact, um, you know, but how has that affected you? I mean, you, you've spoken, you know, you have, uh, devoted your life primarily to writing rather than medicine. Um, you know, as a writer of plays and poetry, um, do you feel that politics has played a role, you know, in sort of how your career, career has unfolded as a, as a writer? First of all, I'm not a poet. I'm a writer. I'm a, 
I wrote, look, I wrote a book called, uh, I mean, my writing, uh, there is, I mean, in one sense, uh, some of my writing it deals with the, uh, really, once again, the bankruptcy, uh, the bankrupt uh, elite of Israel, uh, bankrupt both uh, morally and intellectually and uh, ideologically. Um, and this, uh, I wrote a book, a satirical novel called Bita Malke, uh, that deals with that. I wrote it 25 years ago. It says, you read it today, nothing has changed, as, as if I wrote it yesterday. Uh, which is maybe the reason why it's going to be uh, published in Germany, in German, uh, very soon. Uh, a big, it's a big, uh, among the Russian population of Israel, it's like a sleeper. It's a, one of those cult books because they feel as if, uh, when I describe the control uh, on thinking, uh, America didn't invent political correctness, believe me. And America did not invent uh, cancel culture. This was here well before it arrived in America, uh, unfortunately, because we had a very strong... Uh, a very uh, strong socialist uh, point of view in thinking uh, in early Zionism here in Israel. It was unnatural. We won't get into that, how that happened. But uh, that uh, they took over uh, the uh, forms of expression in Israel in all fields. But uh, so the Russians, the Russian Jews, having come from the Soviet Union, like this book very much. To them, it's a, it's a, it's a wonderful book that describes things as they are. So I dealt with that in the, the book and some of my plays, uh, including in a play that uh, has not been shown yet, but uh, received uh, this important award in Warsaw uh, recently uh, that talks about life in medieval Spain 600 years ago, but it really describes, once again, the elite, the corrupt, the morally corrupt elite uh, in Israeli society or those that conceive of themselves as being the elite. Uh, I don't consider them elite at all. But that's how they view themselves, at least. Now, how that has affected me? Well, it's certainly affected me in terms of what I want to write, because you write about society and where you live, so it, it's affected the themes that I deal with. And I, has it affected me in other ways? I think it probably has. I have not been able to. I mean, the one play that was shown in Israel is a play that was, of course, a... a brought to the attention of the uh, Tel Aviv theater uh, anonymously. Nobody knew who wrote the play, okay? And when they read it, they liked it. They thought it was like the best play they read the, the last five years, and they were very enthusiastic about it and wanted to produce it and to be part of the repertoire. Uh, when they found out who wrote it, well, they became less enthusiastic. Finally, they actually did it, though. They actually did it, and they showed it in a two-weekend festival. And that was enough for me to have theater people from outside of Israel uh, to re know my name, to look at my plays. And uh, so then I developed a career. One of the same, very same play was shown in America, in New York, and off-Broadway, but also mostly my plays have been shown in the countries of the former Soviet bloc, I would say. And in Western Europe, it's very difficult because of the anti-Israeli bias. And once again, the control of the left, the progressive left on the cultural world in Western Europe. As a writer, what gives you the most satisfaction in terms of how you go about it and what you're able to produce? I just love toying with, I mean, I discovered theater quite late in my life. But I love, I love writing theater because the challenge of not only describing characters, but to have a plot evolve and the ideas evolve merely through dialogue between the characters and how they interact with each other, I find fascinating. And it's just, it's enjoyable. I enjoyed very much doing this kind of writing. Uh, obviously, had uh, I not found theaters or directors who will uh, stage my plays, I probably would not have continued writing, but I did. Uh, but I like... Uh, even in this novel that I mentioned, Ita Malke, this is satirical novel about Israeli politics and the cultural life, it's also a lot of dialogue there. That's when I realized that, you know, I really like doing dialogue. So, and maybe theater is a natural way to go. And that's how I attempted to do it. And uh, it started off actually in Italy, of all places. There was a director called Franchini who has a very good 
amateur theater and he liked a play of mine and he, he directed it and staged it. I loved going there to see, you know, these uh, imaginary figures of yours coming to life. In these small theaters in the small towns in northern Italy, every town has a theater there. It's unbelievable <coughs> uh, how important theater is for them. And so in that very play, somebody found out about it in Israel, and that's how finally it was produced in a very limited fashion in uh, Tel Aviv, as I said, two weekends. And that was the end of my life as a uh, playwright in Israel. I made the end of my theatrical career in Israel because it's impossible. No theater will touch me. Uh, and I don't, think it's, I don't think it's a possibility even in Israel for me to have my plays produced uh, for political reasons, that's all. And it's not, it's not only me, it's me. It's because, not because of my name. Uh, certainly my name doesn't help here. But had I been a Netanyahu that had different political leanings to the left, uh, they would have, I think, they would have embraced me. I don't know. I can't say for sure, but I think so. It has to do with the fact that they don't really allow a right-wing into, uh, artists into the realm of uh, the cultural life of Israel. As, the, as I think in America, is very, very similar. A sim- yeah. Similar thing is happening That's there. That's true. Well, let's pivot back for a moment to sort of the events of the day. Um, you know, military service was part of your life, certainly part of your family's story. But that's sort of a, a focus of controversy now, as you know, some reservists, um, it's, it's certainly not universal, but enough to get the notice or refuse, say, are saying they all refuse to uh, report for duty uh-huh. um, because they oppose uh, judicial reform, they oppose the government. What do you think of that? And how is that, you know, that, that's something that is reported in the United States as, you know, this great righteous protest and a broad movement. What are most Israelis thinking about these people, you know, the, these people who are refusing to do service because of political reasons? Okay. Well, virtually all Israelis are against it. Uh, look, it's what's happening in Israel right now is basically a, the attempt of the uh, a minority that controls the various uh, the machinery of government and has been controlling it for a long time to maintain this control, okay? They have been controlling it, I mean, certainly until the election of Menachem Begin in 77, the, everything was controlled by the left. But even afterwards, the machinery itself was still in their hands and has, and the, uh, with the judicial uh, makeover of uh, Chief Justice Aaron Barak in Israel, uh, they're able to maintain this control uh, more and more, actually. It becomes worse and worse over the years, even after Aaron Barak left the Supreme Court, uh, to such an extent that basically the uh, judiciary, which is on the left in the main, uh, is above. It's not only the Supreme Court, it's also the Supreme Executive Branch and the Supreme uh, Legislative Branch. Uh, this is unheard of in a democracy, but this, uh, so long as the left felt that, okay, you know, you guys, you vote for wherever you want to, what can we do? You know, we don't like it. So elect your prime minister, elect your uh, Knesset, but we have the Supreme Court and that'll, whatever they don't like, they'll cancel. Okay. Whether it's government decisions or, or even laws. All of a sudden, they were afraid they're going to lose it and they won't be in control anymore. And uh, so this is what the judicial reform, this, they felt fearful about it. Uh, they did like the fact, of course, of the right to one in Israel, and they'd like to change it very much, and they'd like the government to topple. But also the fact of the judicial reform that we're trying to do uh, was to them something that's uh, unacceptable. And they went all the way to, uh, to the extreme uh, means of trying to change it, and the only way to change it, really, they felt, was to threaten. To threaten Israel, a sort of military threat of sorts. They, of the, well, they're not holding a gun to your hand, but if they're saying, okay, I won't fly the plane, and uh, you, won't have a, you won't have an air force, well, it's a sort of, a, I would say, a military coup of sorts. And well, actually, there was a column in Haaretz uh, last week which actually used the term, you know, yes, it's a military coup and we like it. 
Well, yeah, of course they like it. They don't admit, most of them don't admit that it's a military coup. I'm surprised. I, I, I'm I, sorry I don't read the uh, but <laughs> Well, I do because uh, I get well, it's part your, of my job. Hey, yeah, what can you do? That's, that's life. I thankfully don't have to do that. Yeah, although I do write columns, by the way. I started ever since, uh, I mean, I, besides being a writer, I started writing columns for quite a while now. I felt I had to pitch in. So I, I do that in one of the major Israeli newspapers. But uh, but I know what they're thinking, and I would, even without reading that column, which I'm surprised at, the, at its frankness, uh, they, yeah, that's basically what it is. They're, and they're talking about democracy. Okay, they're talking about uh, uh, that they're all for, for democracy. Uh, look, uh, but the, what's amazing in this whole thing, I'll tell you what, what is really frightening, not the fact that some people decided, that it's happened before, by the way. There are some in the left who... Uh, whether it was the war in Lebanon uh, during Menachem Begin's time, uh, that they uh, said that they won't uh, be willing to participate. And uh, here and there, some Air Force people, some pilots, uh, having to do with the targets that they would uh, bomb, uh, but not not to this extent, that's for sure. Uh, but what's frightening is that you see before your very eyes how intelligent people actually can be manipulated to such an extent. They actually believe in these things. That it's not not those who are saying, you know, pulling the strings. They don't believe in any word that they're saying. But masses of good people, some of them my friends, okay, from the from the unit, from other places, uh, some doctors, they actually believe that uh, the political, the judicial reform, is the end of democracy, the destruction of democracy. And the, uh, the setting up of a dictatorship. Okay, they, they actually believe these things. And you can see before, I mean, you know it by history. I mean, if you know anything about anti-Semitic Semitic history, you know that, yeah, many people, intellectuals, maybe sometimes intellectuals in the forefront, believe in this nonsense about the Jews, you know, that they, uh, whatever, that they poison the wells and they do all sorts of things and uh, et cetera, et cetera. The various uh, canards about uh, the Jews. Uh, so you know that it can happen. You certainly saw it. We saw it in uh, Germany, okay, in, uh, in, uh, in Nazi times. Uh, many people, yes, they believed all these things, that the Jews were uh, the scum of the earth and they should be, uh, should be killed. So you know it, in theory. But here you see before your very eyes how many good and decent people, including, as I said, my friends, are frightened. They're frightened that tomorrow... There's going to be a dictatorship in Israel because of the judicial reform. It's amazing. It's absolutely uh, amazing. And uh, it tells you about a lot about human nature and the force of the uh, propaganda. With tremendous power of propaganda, it appeals to the emotional side of you, the psychological side of you. It does not try to appeal to the rational side because they never, exp- they never explain, they can't explain rationally why uh, this is undemocratic. They... It cannot be explained because it's not, it's not true. So then you have all these doctors, for instance, now they're thinking about, okay, we're going to go and uh, immigrate to New Zealand. Uh, as if in New Zealand, they'll find a law there that's to their liking uh, that allows the Supreme Court to cancel government decisions because of uh, the clause of unreasonableness. Okay. Hey, look, what can I tell you? This, this is really... The whole thing about, uh, I would say, the uh, those who are uh, threatening not to serve in the military, I, I think they too, when the time comes, I mean, they don't want to forsake their families. They'll they'll join. They'll uh, they'll not uh, they'll they'll go and fight, and it's not because of cowardice they're doing it. And uh, also, even in my unit, you know, it was a very leftist unit when I served in it. A lot of members of Kibbutzim. But uh, there was a counter petition by other members of the same unit. There was just as many people, okay? But you don't hear about it in the press. In the Air Force, yeah. same thing. You don't hear about it in the press. And the other special units also. Counter petitioners were saying, no, we will serve in their stead. We don't believe in this. Uh, but you, the press doesn't really report it to any great extent. I don't think this is a... a, a this will change things. It certainly, initially, it was a shock and brought about the, uh, I would say, the uh, the fact that the uh, reform was halted for a while. It was really deep shocking. But we sort of understood after a while that, hey, 
uh, nothing, nothing really will happen. Probably nothing will happen. And so we're able to continue the reform, albeit, albeit to a very, in a very limited, the minor way, you don't want the country to break up. Hmm. You, you, you dropped a name earlier uh, in our conversation, um, Ehud Barak. Um, he is playing, you know, former commander of your unit, as well as of the uh, Israel Defense Forces as a whole, as well as a former prime minister. Yep. He has played a huge role mm -hmm. in organizing the uh, resistance, if you will, right. traditional well, reform. A, what do you think about the role that he's playing right, right now? First of all, you mentioned resistance. It's a copy-paste, of course, of what was done in America. They don't have the yes. original ideas. I, I use the term advisedly, yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Look, we uh, recently, uh, the, uh, in the internet, you can see a tape that uh, he was talking uh, on Zoom. Can you imagine doing it uh, by Zoom to a group of these Air Force pilots? We're talking about three years ago, well before the judicial reform of how, to, of basically telling them what they should be doing eventually. He was talking about the COVID lockdowns. He said, okay, this is, you know, we're going to use the slogan of dictatorship. We're going to use the slogan that they're ruining democracy. Let's try to topple the government in this matter. They're giving the same format, you know, of basically a, a resistance of sorts. You know, whatever is being done now with the flags and everything, it says, don't say that you're on the left, say you're democratic, because who can, who can oppose democracy? What person has right mind would oppose democracy? And so they, you could see that this thing was planned well ahead of time, and they um, fell upon the judicial reform as this great thing that they can twist and, uh, and, uh, and interpret in such a way that they would bring people out into the streets. He was not successful three years ago. He is successful in doing it now. It's not only him, it's other people. Uh, some of them are the hard left. Others are uh, simply want to topple the government for various reasons. But this has not happened. The government will not topple. They, they have not succeeded. And they're going crazy, by the way. They cannot get rid of Bibi. I mean, you know, the, no, they're actually, they're, because he was not toppled or he didn't stop being prime minister after they indicted him. And before that, when they charged him with certain things and all these bogus crimes that he supposedly committed, uh, can you imagine that he, uh, the bribery charge was, uh, the payment was that he received not the stacks of money and not the envelopes, but that he supposedly received some good uh, press in one of the internet sites. Okay, that was the payment that was given him, that was the bribe. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine any prosecution actually inventing that? But they did. And so, uh, uh, but they, by the way, the bribery was uh, the, the, the judges, after hearing the case for two and a half years, recently called the prosecution and uh, told them, you have not proved anything. And we suggest that you drop the bribery charges come to some sort of uh, some sort of settlement. Uh, the prosecution doesn't want to do it for, I imagine, for political reasons. Uh, so there's no bribery. This whole thing is, a, I mean, the whole thing is a sham. But they expected uh, BB to be toppled. It, it cost him some votes, no question about it. But then once the, 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 uh, the trial uh, got in place and people were seeing actually what was there, uh, the support went back because... People have enough sense to realize there's nothing here. There's absolutely nothing here. But uh, they tried to topple him in that way. They expected him to uh, agree to some sort of settlement and drop out of political life. They didn't know who they were dealing with. And now they're trying a different tactic. tactic. But uh, yeah, they're going crazy. After spending hundreds of millions of uh, shekels, and I imagine at least $100, $200 million, they have not yet succeeded and they won't succeed. Right now, so much effort has been put into demonizing <clears throat> your brother by so much of the Israeli media. But how do you think history, your father's profession, will view his life's work? It, well, God, it depends who this Turin is. You know, it's uh, <laughs> very true. Uh, I, I don't put much trust in historians. I, I wouldn't know. Look, he's, well, what's the difference? You know, the question is, is he doing the right thing for Israel or not? And how he, the history views it, you can't control that. You can't know. I, look, he's done wonderful things for Israel, uh, not only economically, but I think also in the fact that he was able to stop Oslo on its tracks and uh, not enable the dissolution of the state of Israel because had this thing continued, 
uh, we, life here would have been unlivable, absolutely unlivable. Uh, it would have been hell. It would have been a nightmare to live here had this Oslo uh, uh, agreement continued to, uh, to its final phases. Uh, uh, so this, uh, he, uh, he did great things, he achieved great things, uh, among which was the fact that he actually stood uh, uh, against all this pressure and was able to be elected, no, no mean feat. Uh, and uh, trying to strengthen Israel and, and succeeding in doing that. So uh, I think whoever is the historian, even the critical historians, would uh, at least concede that he uh, had some great achievements. Uh, I think an objective historian would uh, view he didn't, not, not everything, I don't agree with everything he did, uh, but uh, I think an objective historian would uh, concede that he uh, did great things for the country and did what he could for the betterment of the country under against tremendous odds, against tremendous odds and with great courage. I want to end uh, where we began, to so, sort of, and ask you how you're feeling about Israel's future right now at a time when so many in the country are, as you said, issuing doomsday uh, predictions about the crack up of its society and even talking about civil war after all you've seen and experienced. Are you an optimist about Israel and the Jewish people? Yeah, yeah. I think, uh, look, uh, nothing, nothing is perfect in life. Uh, but, you know, I come from a family that, uh, I'm, I'm, you probably haven't heard of the Olozov affair, okay? Uh, I have. Is, oh, you have? Okay. Maybe many, many of our, uh, our, our viewers and yeah. listeners may, may well, not, I'll, I'll but just, yes. Just in a gist. Okay, if I, if you have if we have the time, sure. uh, my family was deeply involved in the Rosal affair. Uh, this uh, this uh, major Zionist uh, uh, labor leader who was murdered in 19, 90 years ago, exactly ninety years ago, was murdered in Tel Aviv, and three members of the right wing faction of the Zionist movement of the revisionist movement were accused of murdering him, of murdering him. Uh, and my father who was a. Uh, a student at the university at that time knew that this was a blood libel. It was orchestrated by the Labour Party. Okay, and the British, of course, hey, for them it was great. Okay, they wanted to get rid of these people, uh, these troublemakers. He, he knew it was a blood libel, not least because he met two of these supposed murderers. Okay, at that very same day, uh, towards evening in Jerusalem, not in Tel Aviv, in Jerusalem, and they went to a lecture that one of them was giving in Jerusalem in the evening. So he knew they could not have been in Tel Aviv to commit a murder. Nevertheless, the police charged them, uh, and one of them was sentenced to death. I think two of them initially were sentenced to death. And uh, my father uh, decided that he has to create a newspaper to fight this blood libel, and he did indeed. And the first issue came out on the day that the trial opened. And my grandfather, uh, we didn't talk about him, but he was a very great believer in Zionism. He was considered a great orator uh, my father's father, a great orator, uh, maybe the premier orator of the Zionist movement, he, they say, and he went uh, in Poland, he spoke for maybe in uh, 300 towns. Uh, they say that he was maybe the person who was most responsible for creating, uh, for making Zionism a popular movement in, in Poland, which uh, at that time had millions of Jews. My grandfather who was a rabbi. Uh, also understood that this was a blood libel, and he went to his friend, Rabbi Cook. Rabbi Cook was the chief rabbi of the uh, of the yeshuv of uh, Palestine at that time, and uh, persuaded him to come out uh, to head a committee of rabbis for the defense of the accused. And this is what they did: tremendous attacks on these murderers, on these uh, fascists, you name it. On Jabotinsky, on my father, of course, as the head of the newspaper, on my grandfather as well. He died shortly afterwards. On Rabbi Cook, okay, how can he support these uh, these murderers? And at that time, the Labor Party, this right shortly after the murder of Lozovov, of course, everybody was besmirching the right wing, and they won the elections. They probably would have lost the elections had it not been for that they had blood libel. So my family is well versed in all these things, well versed in. The very difficult times and chasm in the Zionist movement in Israel, and in the fact that the uh, left uh, 
you know, Begin had to, uh, with a few thousand men, uh, fought against uh, the British Empire in Palestine, against uh, the uh, the left, who were uh, reporting or were actually uh, working against the uh, the members of the Ngun and taking them to the British. Some of them were uh, killed by the British. Others were simply put in jail. Uh, this was the doings of the left. So in, in different times, there have been tremendous clashes. We, we got through it. Okay, we got through it. We'll get through it this time as well. And especially since the majority of the Israeli population uh, stands behind the government, they're against, even those on the left, many of them are against uh, these people who are uh, trying to uh, uh, not to their uh, military service, uh, these uh, semi-seditious acts or whatever you call it by those who are trying to instigate it. And uh, I don't, I, I, I'm, I, I know what people think, I know what people say, not the media, okay, the media is one thing. Uh, the population, I, I foresee a good future for Israel. Uh, the main problem is Israel remains, was and remains Iran and its uh, attempts to uh, create a nuclear arsenal. That is the main threat to Israel, and that's a threat that needs to be addressed. Yes, well, um, I think that sums it up very well. Uh, Dr. Netanyahu, thanks so much for joining us today and for your really fascinating stories and insights. I also want to thank our audience. Please remember to tune in every day for Top Story Daily Edition. And whether you're listening to us on Apple, Google Play, Spotify, or any of the other podcast platforms, or watching us live on Facebook or Twitter, or on the JNS YouTube channel, please like and or subscribe to Top Story, click on the bell for notifications, and give us good reviews. Uh, please write to us at editor at jns.org and let us know where you listen or watch the show and what you think about it. And remember, keep reading and thinking for yourself, and we'll see you again next week.